When we talk about ionization, it refers to the ability of a molecule or an atom to ionize or give up and dissociate into its uh, ions. When we talk about amino acids specifically, we are talking about the ability to donate or accept hydrogens. So when we take a look at this general structure of an amino acid, we see that we have that alpha carbon and the four different substituents of the hydrogen, carboxyl group, amino group, and that R group. Remember that the R group will be different for uh, the different amino acids. Now the carboxyl group is able to pick up a hydrogen or it could donate a hydrogen. Therefore, it is ionizable. Therefore, it will have a pKa value. Remember that pKa just uh, refers to the ability to dissociate or ionize. Now, uh, for the carboxyl group, we have a pKa of 2.2. And for the amino group, our pKa is 9.6. Now these values are going to be very important when we determine whether the amino group or the carboxyl group has a hydrogen bound or if it does not have a hydrogen bound. Now if we take a look at this R group, depending on what amino acid we are looking at, some R groups will be ionizable, some will not be ionizable. Um, and depending on whether it is ionizable or, or not, it will affect the ionization of the overall amino acid. So a term we must be familiar with when we talk about ionization and amino acids is Zwitter ions. So a Zwitter ion is a molecule. It is essentially a molecule that has both positive charge and it has a negative charge. And plus one, minus one will cancel each other out. We get zero. So neutrality. So a Zitter, Zwitter ion is a neutral molecule. It has a positive and a negative charge, but they cancel out. And a Zwitter ion is able to act as an acid or a base. And we'll see why. Now, taking a look at this Zwitter ion right over here, it, we can see that it's a general amino acid. We have that R group, carboxyl, amino group, hydrogen. At a pH of 7, at a pH of 7, the carboxyl group does not have a hydrogen, but the amino group has that extra hydrogen. The amino group is protonated, the carboxyl group is deprotonated. Now let's break these up into two distinct parts. So the Zwitter ion can act as an acid. What do we know about acids? Acids donate protons. So if the Zwitter ion is acting as an acid, it must donate a proton. Well, our amino group, it has an extra proton. So what is it going to do? It's going to donate it. When it donates, we are left with NH2, and we get that proton. So in this sense, the Zwitter ion is acting as an acid because it's donating a proton. But how, do, how does the Zwitter ion act as a base? Well, what do we know about a base? Well, a base accepts a hydrogen. So if we take a look at the carboxyl group of the Zwitter ion, it has a negative charge, so that oxygen has a negative charge, and it's able to pick up a hydrogen. It picks up a hydrogen, uh, it no longer has that negative charge because oxygen has a bond now, and that's how it acts as a base. So essentially, in this case, this Zwitter ion, the amino group is able to donate protons, and a base is able, the carboxyl group is able to act as a base and accept protons. And this is extremely important when we talk about buffers, because what are buffers doing? They are taking the excess acid, or they're taking the excess, um, excess base, and they're neutralizing it. Now, when we talk about the ionization in more detail, let's look at an example of an amino acid. This is phenylalanine. Phenylalanine has this general amino structure and it has that R group in which it has a CH2 and it has a resonance stabilized aromatic ring. Now this R group has no ionizable groups so we only have two ionizable groups which is of course our carboxyl group and our amino group. Since they're ionizable uh, which means they're able to donate or accept their protons they will have a pKa value. The carboxyl group once again will be 
the amino group will be 9.6. Now it's important to note about ionization amino acids and whether or not they're losing protons or gaining protons is that when the pH of the solution, when the pH of the solution is equal to the pKa, we will see that one form, so HA, will be in equilibrium with A minus. Now, to make it more clear, let me draw it out like this. So I'm just going to draw out the uh, just the general structure, not the R group. Now, if everything is protonated, everything is protonated. This is our HA because remember our this is HA represents our acid. Acids will donate a proton. So if this donates a proton, it will first lose it from the carboxyl group. And it will still be protonated over here. This is our A minus because we've lost a hydrogen. This one, this molecule just donated its hydrogen. So I should draw out H plus. So this amino acid donated its hydrogen. This was our HA. This is our A minus because we lost that uh, we lost that H plus. And if we and if this A minus gains it back, we'll get HA once again. So when our pH of our solution equals our pKa, the HA and A minus will be in equilibrium with one another. Okay, so they will uh, be in equal concentration. But once the pKa is above our pKa, this will predominate in this case. So why will it predominate? Because think about it. PKA refers to the dissociability. If our, and we know that once, as we increase our pH, we are reaching our PKA value, the carboxyl will donate its hydrogen because that's its dissociability. And if we keep increasing our pH, they'll, there will reach a point where all of the all of this form uh, that has that H with the carboxyl will be deprotonated, and we will no longer have the protonated form of the carboxyl because the pH is increasing, increasing, increasing. So this A minus will predominate. So if we classify this as form A and this as form B, we can say that once our pH has increased 2.2, because at 2.2 it's in equilibrium. Once it increases 2.2, form B will predominate in the solution. Now, if this is form B, how do we get to form C? Well, form C is when our pH of the solution will surpass 9.6, because 9.6 is the pKa of the amino group. And in order for the amino group to donate its hydrogen, we have to reach a pH of 9.6 in our solution. So once we have surpassed 9.6, the form C will predominate in which both the amino group and the carboxyl group will be deprotonated. So what's important about this? Remember that we have to be able to determine, first of all, what our charges are, where it is a Zwitter ion, and what form is predominating. We've determined what form will predominate when, depending on our pH and our pKa values, but let's talk about the charge. So in form A, when everything is protonated, what's our overall charge? It's plus one. Because remember, there is no negative over here. We only have that positive charge because every this nitrogen is protonated. So form A has a plus one charge. Essentially, that means that if our pK, the pH of our solution is below 2.2, everything is protonated plus one charge. Now, if the pH of the solution surpasses 2.2, this carboxyl group loses its hydrogen, gains a negative charge. What's the overall charge? It's zero. Okay, so the overall charge is now zero, and we see that over here. Now, if this nitrogen loses that extra hydrogen, 
it will no longer have a positive charge. What's the overall charge now? It's going to be negative 1, and we see that over here. So determining the charge is very important, and that charge will continually change depending on how many ionizable groups we have and what the pH of the solution is. Now the last thing to make note of is where is this amino acid existing as a zwitter ion? Remember that a zwitter ion is when the charge is neutral. So where is the charge neutral? It's right over here. The charge is neutral when we have both A and we have both A and B. Okay. So the way to determine this is once you have uh, listed all of your pKa values in ascending order, take the two pKa values in which uh, the zero is encased in. So essentially, uh, we have 2.2 and we have 9.6. So you take uh, this 2.2 corresponds here, this 9.6 corresponds here. So you would take 2.2 plus 9.6 and you would take the average of the two. So here, 9, 10, 11, 11, 0.678, 8. And if we divide that by 2, we get 5.9. And that means at a pH of 5.9, phenylalanine will exist as a zwitter ion. Zwitter ion is when the charge is 0. Now, the this value of uh, 5.9, uh, we have a special designation for that, and we refer to that as PI. So we would say our PI is 5.9, and this just represents the pH at which our molecule, our amino acid, exists as a zwitter ion. Now, this value of PI will be different for various amino acids because, remember, it's possible for our R groups to be ionized. For all the non-ionizable R groups, we will always see a PI of 5.9. But when we have ionizable R groups, it will be different. Now, aspartate has a ionizable R group. It has a carboxyl group with a pKa of 3.9. Now, in form A, we are form A, we see that a pH is less than 2.2 in our solution, so everything will be protonated. Overall charge is plus 1. Once the pH of the solution surpasses 2.2, we see that our carboxyl group over here loses its proton and we get an overall charge of zero. Because remember, this will be protonated still because its pH has not been reached. And plus one, minus one will make zero. So this is the position at which we will see our zwitter ion. So we have to calculate the point at which we will see our zwitter ion. So remember, pi instead of saying pH we say PI and we have 2.2 plus 3.9 divided by 2 and here we would get 2.2 plus we get 3.05 so the point at which aspartate would exist as a zwitter ion in our solution is when the PI is 3.05. Now, this is very important because amino acids with ionizable R groups will have different PIs. So we must know at what point each amino acid will exist as a zwitter ion.